question is, Senator Rhiannon. Thank you, Mr. President. The Greens' trade and foreign investment protecting the public interest bill should be passed. Such legislation would play a critical role in protecting and enhancing our democracy. And I very warmly and strongly congratulate Senator Peter Wish Wilson for initi initiating this bill before us. I speak about democracy because it really is about protecting democracy, protecting Australia as a sovereign nation, um, making it harder to run down the all-important gains that society has um, managed over a number of decades with regard to labour standards, environmental protection, human rights, because uh, the um, protection this bill would place would bring some balance back to the very damaging aspects of um, free trade and specifically the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So uh, this bill is urgently needed. And there has been a long history in Australia of opposing some of the very damaging aspects of um, the push for free trade, and I would like to go into some of that history. I also wanted to congratulate, um, as well as um, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, many members of the Greens, the union movement, AFTINET, um, church groups, environment and human rights organisations, and aid groups, because they are out there informing the public of how serious it is in terms of the secret negotiations um, and if the um, partnership and um, particularly with regard to the investor state dispute settlement clauses, if that's put in place, the degree of damage it would do to the very fabric of our society um, from our important basis of uh, democratic institutions reaching into so many aspects of, of our society that often we take for granted. Uh, so this is in incredibly important that we deal, deal with this. Now, I think it's worth reminding ourselves uh, that a previous government, uh, the Howard government, in 2004 did not include ISDS in that free trade agreement. Now, I mention that because um, when uh, former Prime Minister John Howard came in in the 1990s. His government really got their fingers burnt with what they were trying to do when they were meddling in a very similar scheme, actually a much more extensive scheme, um, that they were trying to in, in, that, that there was um, large corporations attempting to impose across the planet. And I'm referring here to the multilateral agreement on investment. Now you could very um, you could really say that um, the grandparents of the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, and the Investor State Dispute Settlement um, was the OECD and the MAI. Now the OECD, I mean they gave birth to the MAI, but that this was a huge part of the 1990s when um, some various organisations, very under-resourced organisations, some key hard-working activists, unfortunately emails were just coming into their own at that period, found out what was going on and alerted the world. And so many people rose up in opposition, opposition that was extensive and ultimately was successful and multilateral agreement on investment was put to bed. But now we're seeing it come back in different forms. So I think it's worth looking at what happened in the 1990s because it is important. It is important for us to understand that this has been well debated. It's been rejected en masse, not just by Australians, but people around the world. So I did want to go into some of those um, aspects. One important point that was made in that debate, I was very much part of it in the 1990s. I was at the time a director of Aid Watch, a non-government organisation monitoring Australia's overseas aid program, and this became a large part of our work. And Noam Chomsky at the time, one of his arguments was that the OECD, as an organisation of rich countries, was more susceptible to direct influence by corporations. That's who they would be representing uh, and really did advocate that when we're considering changes to trade agreements, it should come under a body such as the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Uh, and th there was a real um, in-depth analysis of how these agreements should occur. 
On the side of those back in the MAI, and there was a period there where there was um, the uh, Liberals and Nationals were, were right out in front, um, and they were arguing, along with the corporate world, that it would bring secure and stable investment conditions, regulate investment in a more uniform, try to reject that it would be a race to the bottom by saying you would have uniform conditions for corporations around the world. But when people started to get a hold of the documents, look at the detail of those documents, what they could see and what the world was alerted to, it was a race to the bottom because it was in fact about um, um, developing means to erode labour conditions, erode environmental standards, erode human rights. Um, and um, That was done by because the power would be there to penalise governments if, such, if there was any measures that restricted the profits of the corporations. So a little bit of history, because it's important that we remember this. Because, like, let's remember, this is all being done in secret. How did the world find out about it? There were some lucky breaks, there were some leaks, and there were some incredibly hard-working people. Um, and they were mainly organisations in low-income countries. Uh, we had the um, Third World Network. There was also the NGO Public Citizen Global Watch, Friends of the Earth, and Susan George, a, a very progressive economist at the time, who was really onto this. The documents were released, the analysis was done, and I remember people at the time saying, what will kill off the multilateral agreement on investment is when people know what it really does. And that's what happened. The documents were analysed, the information was out there, the emails started going around, and it, maybe it was even one of the first examples of an email campaign killing off really bad plans of the corporate world with a few backers, like in Australia's case, the Liberal and National Party. So I do very, very much congratulate those people, and it was a fantastic campaign to be a part of. I did just want to go through how it played out in Australia. We had a Stop the MAI coalition. It was huge and um, brought together uh, unions, um, a whole number of church groups that were incredibly active, aid organisations, environment groups and human rights groups. Um, it culminated in a, and I always like the date this occurred on, it was on November the 11th. There was an, a newspaper advertisement in The Australian signed by more than 500 um, organisations um, setting out the concerns that we had with this whole legislation. And it was um, important that that was um, put on the record because it again obviously helped inform more people. What was interesting that was going on at this time is that obviously the movement was growing around the world. The pressure on France um, was particularly significant because when France, France was the first country to pull the plug on these negotiations. And when that occurred, um, because I, I can't fully explain how the OECD works, of course, but then that really did cripple the negotiations, and shortly afterwards, then the Howard government pulled out of it as well. But it, it was um, um, a, a real strength of the civil society here and around the world that there were so many people active in a very, very um, collaborative, constructive way. Some of the points that we made in the um, advertisement that went in, um, we set out how it was, um, and this is the words from the um, advertisement at the time, the multilateral agreement on investment is a treaty which would give multinational corporations a standing previously only granted to nations and a freer hand to challenge labour standards, environment protection, social justice and democratic control over all levels of government worldwide went on to say Australia must withdraw now and not resume the negotiations in any other form. I give emphasis to that, not resume the negotiations in any other form, because in the 90s we were aware, like we were on the, you could feel the, move, the momentum building around the movement of opposition, uh, you could feel, as you can sometimes with progressive movements, that a win was in the air. But, but we knew that you know, what this is all about. The corporate world is all powerful. They want to increase their profits, like that's what they're on the planet to do, that this could well arise in another form. And that's what we're seeing now with the Trans-Pacific Partnership with so many of these other so-called free trade agreements. And that's why I again wanted to give emphasis to, and why we included there, that all-important phrase, um, Australia must withdraw now, now withdraw from the MAI and not resume the negotiations in any other form. Um, 
Um, and just for the record, um, our former Green Senator, Dee Margetts, was one of the people who signed on to that. The Greens New South Wales did, and a whole number of activists and heaps of organisations around the country. As I mentioned, it was about 500 in all. So that brings us to um, the, the current problems that we face and that they are considerable. And I do urge the senators from the other parties really to look at this closely. Um, from there is nothing in here that serves the interests of um, any group, and I include in that corporations, because if you have this form of so-called free trade, if you have these ISDS clauses passed, it becomes a real robber baron form of capitalism. In the end, it's not good for the corporate world. Maybe they'll increase their profits in the short term, but it becomes destructive not just for workers, not just for the environment, not just for people's human rights. It, be, it really does bring a breakdown in how our society works. And I say, say that most strongly because over time, over decades, indeed um, I believe over centuries, the different protections, the different regulations, the different standards that we have passed and um, brought into practice, what some people try and dismiss as green tape and red tape, have come about to improve our society, a society where it is about being collective beings, it is about supporting each other. And again, yes, in the short term, the corporate world might be really wrapped that we've got ISDS clauses and they can do all this behind closed doors and hammer governments around the world if their profits are limited. But in the long run, it is not going to benefit people. Workers need to get a wage. They need to be able to go home at the end of the day where they haven't been killed or maimed in some ways. We need an environment that is protected, that is there for future generations, where we don't have a huge burden because of the, the levels of pollution. You know, all these things are interconnected, including with how companies operate. So again, I would urge all to look at this closely. Now, the international debate around these issues is growing enormously because there is an increasing recognition that corporations have too much power over our democracies. And this goes back to the starting point, and it's one of the aspects that's impressed me so much about how Senator Peter Wish Wilson has um, taken forward the debate around this issue. He's made all the connections and really pinpointed how damaging this legislation would be if it passed. Um, and it's particularly so damaging because these ISDS clauses in international trade agreements would tip the balance of power further in favour of the corporate world. Now, we're already in, I think things are already out of balance in how much, in how our society works to such a great degree. Um, we need to get back to recognising the broader public interest. Um, the broader public interest in terms of public health, public education, public housing, um, all the um, issues around um, our commons and how that works and what we need to um, uh, look after for a healthy society and look after for future generations. All these issues are interlinked here and it's again a reminder why ISDS clauses in the international trade agreements have no place. They do, such clauses introduce potential risks to the public interest and the sovereignty of any nation. Now, we've seen that um, in many recent studies, um, and I do remember again going back to some of the experiences that I gained when we were opposing the multilateral agreement on investment. Uh, some of the Latin American countries had rules in place that if a foreign corporation was going to operate in their country, that, they, um, had, that, that it was required that that company would employ so many local workers. Now, it was realised that that wouldn't have be, been possible to maintain such a position under the multilateral agreement on investment. And again, like that, that previous experience, limiting the rights of countries in terms of proving their, improving their conditions, that's again why we can see the risks associated with the ISDS. Now, I've mentioned how the, the growing opposition there is to this form of um, a, tr a trade agreement. And it's, that opposition is something that, again, I would urge senators to look closely at. Over 100 academic experts to the European Commission in, um, inquiry into ISDS 
um, have found that the many risks of ISDS clauses imposed on the public interest cannot be simply managed by having certain safeguards for certain sections of, of how these trade agreements would work. You can't put the ISDS clauses in and then establish safeguards. Like That is just a con job to try and make out that something has been done that cannot be effective, cannot um, 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 not remove the extraordinary extent of the damage. We can't even go there in the first place. Um, now, we know that the government proposed safeguards in its deals like the Korean Free Trade Agreement, um, and that again is not satisfactory. We can't solve the problem in that way. Now, the safeguards are going back to the um, study that I was reporting on, a mentioning of the academic experts to the European Commission. Um, the extensive safeguards, the so-called extensive safeguards, were rejected as inadequate most decisively by those academics. Uh, and that's again where we think that um, a considerable attention needs to be paid. Also, I did want to pay tribute to the uh, many groups who are working on this campaign, and the, the, um, one of the leading organisations is in Australia is AFTINET, that's taken up this issue for well over a decade now in terms of examining the free trade agreements that come forward, coming down to this parliament, briefing people, um, putting the material out there. And I would just like to um, include a quote from Pat Reynolds, who works for AFTINET. Um, in talking about um, the ISDS clauses, she states, give additional rights to foreign investors to challenge domestic laws, which may be made as part of protecting or advancing human rights or environmental sustainability. Those are the kinds of examples that we cite in our submission. So our worry is that ISDS has the potential to undermine or challenge domestic law, which seeks to protect those broad principles of human rights and environmental sustainability. So that's been very much a theme of the comments that I've shared with senators today, that the, the degree of destruction that ISDS would bring to the very fabric of our um, legal protections, the fabric of so many standards that have been established, um, and therefore go to the heart of the democratic process. If you have um, a, corp a corporate power structured in a way that is higher, greater than parliaments, than governments, uh, then clearly it is a challenge to democracy. So that is why um, we Greens are giving such emphasis to this, and it's um, why that so much of civil society in Australia has done the examination, are alerting people around the country to these problems. And I um, do believe that this is a time when we need to take the strongest um, stand. Um, I think it's also informative that um, um, Justice French has actually given a very substantial paper about this where he goes into it in detail. Now, I understand that some of the se senators from other parties they may not be willing to um, take on board what the Greens are saying, but again I wanted to emphasise it's much wider than our, our, ourselves. And Justice French, I would very much urge that you read the paper, the very detailed paper that he gives, because he raises the very critical aspects of the lack of transparency that goes on here. As I mentioned with the multilateral agreement on investment, it was because of some incredible hard work, some good breaks, some leaks, that the word was able to spread about the damage that would do. Equally now, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, highly secretive, but some excellent work has been done by civil society, by Senator Peter Wish Wilson getting the word out there. And Justice French adds to this all-important work, particularly identifying issues around the lack of transparency. And this certainly is a re reoccurring theme when you start to examine what is going on here. Something that is solely, uh, so secretive, one has to ask why. And the, and the answer there is, is because that those who are involved know that it is, will be deeply unpopular, that if people understand the detail, the opposition will start growing, will become, put more pressure, 
My guess is they probably remember what happened in the 1990s. Probably many of them were around, and they learned from their side of politics, wanting to serve the corporate interests, how they had to manage the debate around this. And again, they have tried to keep it secret. Senator Peter Wish Wilson is to be congratulated. This bill is excellent, and it should be Order passed. Senator, Thank you, Mr. Um, President. A remark.